Uh, so our first panel today uh, is entitled Corruption Undermining International uh, Economic uh, Development. So we're taking a large perspective. Uh, we're not just focusing inwards, we're focusing outwards uh, to, to set the stage for what is hopefully going to be a, a, a very multifaceted uh, program as Dean Sossin has uh, suggested. Uh, and to do this today we have three uh, renowned, um, important, and, and, and challenging speakers. Uh, Tony Murray, who is a former director of the Canadian Police College. Juan Ronderos, who is with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, and, and Kevin Davis, uh, who is uh, with uh, the NYU Law School. Uh, so as Margaret uh, intimated to you, we're going to try to stick to time. Uh, and therefore, I'm not going to go more into these people's extensive bios. You have them uh, in the program, and I invite you to consult them if you want to know more about these fantastic individuals. Uh, and we're going to kickstart the program right away with uh, giving each speaker 15 minutes to uh, present uh, uh, what they have prepared for us today. And then we'll open the floor to questions and hopefully have a meaningful and challenging discussion. Again, I remind you that everything is being recorded. Uh, in case that needs to, uh, in, in case that affects what, what you're going to say at, at, at the microphone. Uh, so I'd invite uh, Donita Murray to start us off following Thank the you. program. Could you pass the. Uh, yes. yes. Please. Yeah. Thank in you. fact, for the speakers, you can speak from your seat or if you want to go to the podium, to Let's the podium try there's. How this works. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> oh. Okay, Juan. Okay, well, uh, what it doesn't say in my bio is that I am sometimes technologically challenged. The other thing is that I am a terrible timekeeper. So I'm going to rely on my dear friend Margaret Beer to just let me know when the 15 minutes are up. But to start off with the first slide, my paper is really about um, three cases of grand corruption in Kenya and in Afghanistan. I worked in Afghanistan for 10 and a half years and have been working in Kenya for the last year and so have um, had first-hand uh, observations of um, corruption in both these countries. Just to give you a little profile, these slides um, show the GDP of the various countries what a difference a letter makes. As you see, for Kenya, the GDP was uh, $44.10. There's a B missing off that figure. It's actually $44 billion. And the ODA is the official development assistance, which is provided by donor countries, uh, at $2.6 billion. For Afghanistan, the ODA is more than $6 billion. And that actually has declined from 10 years of massive injection of ODA into that economy. Um, I've put Canada as a contrast, and the last line um, in red shows the amount of money that Canada in 2013 um, provided as ODA to the um, intermediary agencies, the uh, multilateral donor agencies such as the IMF, the World Bank, and uh, the United Nations. In addition to that is a lot of bilateral donations, which brings Canada's total um, international assistance to something like $5 billion a year. So this means that uh, Canada really has an interest in making sure that there's not too much leakage of that $5 billion into corrupt practices and into the pockets of politicians and um, also diverted away from its, its target, which is usually for uh, development in um, education and health 
and building infrastructure and also ensuring a stable criminal justice system. Um, just to give you some indication of the degree of corruption in the two countries that I'm discussing, um, these are the Transparency International uh, figures for the 2013, I believe. Um, and as you can see, that they're both very much at the bottom of the, the indices. Afghanistan, in particular, is the second most corrupt country in the world, and Kenya is in that 25, 27% of the most corrupt countries in the world. Um, looking at it from another uh, survey point of view, from an international business uh, a survey conducted by the World Bank, this will give you some idea of the business climate in, uh, in Kenya and how difficult it is for businesses to actually um, manage to do their, their business without paying bribes. And uh, as you will see, for things like water connections, for, uh, for construction permits, that um, a third of companies uh, have, have reported that they pay, have paid bribes. Similarly with Afghanistan, as you can see that this is even more blatant, that uh, the um, cost of doing business for uh, businesses wanting to invest in Afghanistan, and goodness knows Afghanistan needs uh, a lot of direct investment to get its con economy kick-started, but there are all these barriers of, um, of bribery that have to be overcome for businesses to set up. These are both um, domestic businesses and international business businesses. Looking at the literature, since about the beginning of the 1990s, there's been quite a lot of academic interest, which Francois had mentioned earlier, in uh, corruption. And uh, economists mainly have uh, developed various uh, theories on the causes of corruption. Um, the prevailing view for a while was that uh, countries with common law systems where there was a, a common law legal culture, uh, customs with uh, countries with um, a large Protestant population, um, political stability, long experience of democracy, tended to be less corrupt. So by inference, the countries that aren't those uh, don't have those characteristics, are prone to more corruption. And if we're to look at the three cases I'm going to describe, on the whole, although there's some, uh, some questions with respect to the size of government and uh, to the fact that both countries are democracies but are not long-standing democracies, and that both of them have a very free and active press, in fact, they do conform with the, uh, the theories that have uh, been propounded. Um, the, the, both countries are ex ethnically fractionalized, low incomes, political instability, and um, as I say, not a very long um, uh, history of, uh, of democracy. When um, these theories, economic theories, have also been en uh, empirically tested, and the results have been mixed. What tends to come out is definitely that political stability and Protestantism seem to be correlated with low levels of corruption. Otherwise, all the other theories have a question mark beside them. But even so, these two countries would still continue to conform, particularly with income levels, the ethnic uh, hostility, and um, the uh, 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 income levels and political instability. 
So that's the background to the cases that I'm going to discuss. The three are the Goldenberg International, which um, uh, was uh, a Kenyan company for uh, ostensibly set up to export gold and diamonds. Anglo Leasing, which was a company which uh, received a lot of uh, Kenyan government contracts, and the Kabul Bank, um, which uh, took in money from small depositors and then loaned it out. And I'll show you how they loaned it out as we go through. Um, although these all look like historical cases, in actual fact, they are all still active and are being actively investigated. Hmm. There we go. Stiff button, I think, on there. So with respect to Goldenberg, the, the amount of money that was siphoned away from uh, the government of Kenya treasury was something over a billion dollars ultimately. And at one point, the treasury was practically empty. The case uh, occurred in a particular time when there were economic difficulties in Kenya. Uh, there was something approaching a dictatorship in uh, the president of the time who ran a very corrupt uh, uh, political system. And so the country was ripe for this sort of scheme. There were two pieces of legislation. One was um, the exchange control because Kenya had a hard currency crisis at the time, and so no one could deal in hard currency but the government, the central bank. The second one was to encourage exports, particularly non-traditional goods. There was a 20% uh, premium paid to exporters, 20% um, value of what was exported. Goldenberg was set up to um, export gold and diamonds, and in um, its agreement with the government, the government agreed to pay a 15% premium over the 20%. So it was getting 35% on everything it exported, except it exported nothing. And in fact, was able, it had access to bridging finance to help it uh, export the goods to prepare them for export. So it was getting money from that, it was putting in false customs declarations, and it was getting its, uh, the money that came from the government in the bridging finance, it was buying hard currency on the black market, and maybe the best thing to do here is to go to this chart and then depositing it in the banks to go back to uh, the government so that it could get its premium. A few banks protested at what Goldenberg was doing, so nothing daunted. The government gave Goldenberg its own uh, hard currency dealership license and then gave it a license to set up its own bank, uh, the exchange bank. So the whole customs and uh, export of gold and sil uh, uh, diamonds was just really an excuse to set up what was a very large money laundering operation. The money leaving government going through exchange bank and Goldenberg and uh, then being diverted for the most part, to a, a fund for the next elections. And elections in developing countries are usually very expensive um, because nearly everybody has to be bribed. And the culture in Kenya is such that most voters expect to get some benefit for their vote. And as you saw, there's a population of 44 million, so it makes it rather expensive to uh, run an election. 
The outcome of the um, Goldenberg uh, case was that no, the IMF tried to intervene because it had destabilized the economy and also the finances of the company. Uh, it blocked all um, loans, all development aid to the country. Um, but no one ended up being charged. Um, a new president was elected who opened an inquiry. There was a thousand pages of testimony, still nothing happened. And just recently this year, Patney, who was uh, an East, um, uh, he was an Asian Kenyan businessman who had been the front man for Goldenberg and the Exchange Bank. Um, he has uh, appealed to the court to have the whole, uh, all the charges against him dismissed on the grounds that it infringed on his constitutional rights. And the court actually granted him that. So in actual fact, apart from the Law Society of Kenya not being very pleased about it, he seems to be home free. Um, the second case, much more simple, is um, Anglo leasing. And this was really uh, just a case of very simple uh, government contracts, uh, mainly in the security field, and therefore escaped a lot of scrutiny uh, of the, these companies being awarded government contracts uh, at, again, at an inflated price. Uh, this happened at the time that the new president had appointed an ethics and corruption uh, czar to deal with corruption. The uh, ethics and corruption uh, czar actually uh, discovered what was happening. It was all his colleagues, the vice president, the minister of finance, and so on, all the top politicians who were... Uh, responsible, and he, they told him quite openly, yes, well, don't investigate us, because if you do, we won't have money for the next elections. He, in the end, was threatened and had to leave the country, and uh, 10 years later <coughs> is still in exile. The Cobble Bank case, Um, was even more crude. It was, um, it was set up about 10 years ago <coughs> and um, became the, prom the most prominent bank in Afghanistan. It actually had the government payroll uh, for um, dispersing each month. That government payroll, I should say, was not coming from the Afghan budget. It was actually coming from international donors because Afghanistan is a rentier state. It's not able to even pay for its own security. And so any money that the government disperses comes from international uh, uh, sources. In addition, the, um, there were uh, lotteries and all sorts of advertisements for uh, small uh, savers, the newly employed, to set up savings accounts. The money was then um, uh, loaned to 19 highly influential people connected to government, including the brother of President Karzai and the brother of one of the vice presidents. <coughs> it was unsecured, no interest, no formal agreements. And uh, two sets of books kept. The money, again, went to election expenses for the president's 2009 election and to buying real estate in Dubai and um, to actually loaning money to the vice president's brother to buy shares in Cobble Bank. 
So this too um, is ongoing. No one in any of these cases has uh, gone to jail. Uh, the new president, Ashraf Hani, has opened um, an investigation and hopes that all will be solved and out of the way within three months. I would say good luck. Um, what is probably likely to happen is with the previous president, the, it will all quietly die. So let's look at some of the common features of these cases because it's the features that will help us uh, us or the people in these countries or the uh, international donors to get a handle on how to deal with this sort of very blatant uh, uh, corruption. There are obviously the political, social, and cultural factors. And um, of these, um, an interesting one is that the cases were so blatant that everybody knew about them. They weren't secret, but there was not a, um, a culture <coughs> where the public would start to protest and demand that something be done. In all of the cases, finding money for the government to uh, pay for the next election was a motive. That uh, in terms of governance, <coughs> we are talking about billions. There's not uh, you know, small sums or modest sum sums by any manner of means. And the fact that there was no public uh, protest, I suppose, encourages uh, the idea that you can go after billions rather than, than millions. Lack of capacity in the public service to hold banks or businesses to account, um, no transparency. The fact that where there were regulations, they didn't control what was happening, but actually enabled it. The they, uh, perpetrators were able to, um, uh, to manipulate the regulations. Uh, And then the, the people factors. And um, these are very important because this is probably where we can, um, in terms of investigation, find the entry into doing something about it. There were three types of papers, uh, people involved. There were the, the, the politicians who um, escaped penalty, and there were also the enablers or the facilitators who were often business people who were outsiders who were used by the politicians uh, to be able to perpetrate these three major corruptions. And then, of course, there were the scapegoats, the minor officials who were blamed uh, and diverted attention from the politicians. So just to conclude, um, we need to look at these uh, political, social, cultural factors, the governance factors, and the, um, the ones of how the, the people involved managed to perpetrate these particular cases, and then the international factors. The, a lot of international aid is uh, pumped into developing countries and the countries are often unable to absorb it. So there's all this money floating around, not really having a good development target. It's also not very well managed. The, the funding is not well managed on the ground. And although there are all sorts of uh, impersonal systems of management for funding, distance and communication and disjunctions between the donor countries, the implementing agencies, and the people actually on the ground means that a lot of management c controls um, just don't work very well. And so development money is not being used to the best advantage. And it ends up that the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries 
the children, the sick, the, you know, the people who need roads to take their goods to market are the ones who don't benefit. It's actually the fat cat politicians. Thank you. mentioning countries that are not part of what we look at at the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and um, we uh, are in charge of looking at things and, and, and working with Latin America and the Caribbean. But before I start, let me just do the, the legal disclaimer that not what I'm about to say, and I'm sure that not what my colleague, uh, Michelle Ratpan, who will be speaking tomorrow, is about to say, uh, can be a tribute to the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank. There are our own uh, ideas uh, and our own expressions of what we think about the systems um, and um, I just wanted to make that clear since this is going to be recorded and televised at some point. Uh, so uh, what, what, what I wanted to do and, and this is what I attempted to do in the paper in which I'm working with the assistance of Michelle is to try to look at the fight against uh, transnational or international corruption from the different angles of what's happening in national uh, authorities, with national authorities, and what is happening with multilateral development banks. Um, and the first thing that is very important to, to, to see and, and to understand is that this fight against uh, uh, international corruption is fairly new. It has started, if you look at the, the, the numbers of enforcement and, and what um, the American authorities, for instance, have done um, and the uh, European authorities and the multilateral development banks have done in terms of fighting corruption. It started in the early 2000s. Uh, before that, uh, there, there was much talk about it, but not, not much been done. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do with this, with, with this paper is to try to go back and, and, and find the connections between the national authority systems and the national enforcement and that enforcement of these agencies. A lot has been written about what the multilateral development banks uh, have done and my colleagues uh, Pascal Dubois and Frank Pariello and Anne-Marie Leroy from the World Bank have written some articles about that kind of work. Uh, and about the FCPA you can find hundreds of articles with all kind of different takes on not only the history of the FCPA but the controversy around the FCPA and the uh, extraterritorial arm of the U.S. law and all sort of different uh, aspects of it. Um, but very little has been done in trying to see where they both m meet and also how they both are different and how they both look at the concept of corruption from a different as uh, angle. And one thing that jumps to mind is that when we're talking about corruption in, in, in light of these different systems, we probably mean different things. Um, and, and that's what I intend to, to, to show today um, by going through the history of the FCPA uh, broadly and then jumping into the Canadian um, equivalent of the FCPA, which is the Corruption and Foreign Public uh, Official Act, uh, the SFPOA, and uh, also what we do at the MDBs, and I'm hoping to stick to time given that I'm Latino, I may be extending a little bit more, uh, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so why is that uh, there's a big difference? If you look at um, I guess I have to do this.
FCPA ends up in the press. And you will see it in the Wall Street Journal, you will see it in the you know, Financial Times, in all the newscasts, the newspapers, um, uh, in all the media outlets that are interested with this type of topic. And they try to go after what I would describe as the big fish. Big companies uh, uh, try to get the big bang for the money, if you will, try to see who are the biggest targets, where they can actually do the most. And also enforcement is very recent. And as I said, you know, the big cases have started like in the mid 2000s. And, and then on it has picked up uh, probably during the time in which uh, uh, Mark Mendelssohn was the head of the FCPA unit at the uh, Department of Justice. Um, and, and this is the type of, uh, you know, titles that you get, uh, uh, headlines that you get in, 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 the, uh, in the news. Now, what you see in the type of work that we do is a little bit different. We take a sort of a different approach because we're looking at corruption in multilateral development banks a little bit differently. We actually give aid to countries uh, so we can do development in those countries and we do this through loans so we can have different type of projects that actually help people. But with fraud and corruption, what we see is that the money that we're giving to these countries are not really going for the intended purposes. And therefore, we need to actually uh, be true to the fiduciary duty that we have as uh, international civil servants to make sure that the money that we're lending to these countries go to the intended purpose. And that marks a little bit of a different of the, the angle that we look at this from. Let me go back to the FCPA and give you a little bit of history of how we ended up fighting corruption internationally. So the FCPA uh, was created in 1977 in the US and it was done based on a number of things, but mainly the Watergate scandal. Through the investigations of the Watergate and the investigations that were being done by Congress and, and the SEC, uh, they found that a number of large corporations in the US were bribing foreign officials for all kinds of different purposes. Um, I would say that some of the main cases that are say, cited out there are, for instance, the Lockheed uh, case, in which Lockheed, today Lockheed Martin, which is a DOD contractor, was bribing uh, or bribed the, the Japan Prime Minister so they would buy some airplanes um, uh, in, a, in a national airline. Um, also, it is reported that Lockheed uh, bribed a, uh, a general in Saudi Arabia. One of the key issues that jumped out, and in fact, there's a very interesting um, um, uh, op-ed, not op-ed, but an editorial in the Washington Post in 1976, uh, which calls the attention to Congress and government saying, uh, it is perhaps not a good idea that people out there see that a company such as Lockheed is paying bribes to government foreign officials uh, because it may be seen as an extended arm of the U.S. government, given that um, the whole existence of Lockheed is DOD contracts. Um, so there's this foreign, um, foreign relations aspect to it. Uh, the SEC was taking a different stance on, on this type of issue. The SEC was looking at these bribery cases as an issue with investors because investors were not, being, were not seeing the full picture. They were finding about the bribes just because of the investigations, but the bribes were not being reported in the accountings. So the SEC was concerned that the accountings were not truthful. Uh, and which was an issue for the, for, the, for the investors. So at the time, there were two type of discussions. One, should we then make it sort of quote unquote legal to make pay, uh, bribe payments abroad and let people report that in their accountings so investors know what they're getting into? Or should we penalize this? And given the whole environment of what was going on, including the banana gate, I don't know if you some of you read or remember that back then, a uh, high official of a, uh, uh, one of these banana, big banana companies jump off uh, on a, a building in New York to his death because they found that they'd been bribing the president of Honduras to get tax exemptions uh, in, in, in Honduras for producing bananas. Um, and, and all of this um, climate led to the enactment of the FCPA. Now, very little enforcement happened through the first 10 years of the FCPA. And surprisingly enough, by 1988, the uh, business community jumped on and went to Congress and said, this is unfair. You're creating an un unfair 
playing field for all of us because we're not being able to go out and compete with other multinational corporations from other countries such as Germany where paying bribes was legal at the time and they could be deducted from taxes. Uh, so we need to actually do something about it. And in fact, Congress at the time passed the Omnibus Trade um, and Competitive Act of 1988, where it specifically mandated the government of the US to go to the OECD and request a convention to outlaw bribery by all these countries. And so that's how the Convention on Combating uh, uh, Bribery of Foreign Officials of, of the OECD came to be. Uh, it was an effort to try to level the playing field. But it was coming from the business community saying, we need to make this uh, a fair game for everyone, so all the Europeans need to be playing by the same rules that we're playing. And, and that's how all the countries that are part of the OECD end up with a similar legislation to the one that the uh, US has, which is the FCPA. Um, now we move to Canada. Uh, in Canada, we have uh, the, the, the current legislation, uh, which only recently has sprung to life. And you can see, that you, you've probably heard of the SNC-Lavalin case. And I'm hoping that Michelle speaks about it a little bit tomorrow. Um, it has a, only, that, that I'm aware of, a handful of cases. Um, and I'm going to be talking about two that touch the multilateral development banks. One, which is pre-enforcement or pre-existence of the, of the uh, uh, CFPOA, and that is the Acres case. The Acres case is a case that has to do with bribery of uh, foreign officials in Lesotho, and it's tied to the Lesotho Highlands project, which was a, uh, a project financed by the World Bank. The Lesotho courts found that Acres International, uh, International a Canadian firm, uh, with um, Lohmeyer, which is a, a German firm, were bribing officials to be able to get contracts. Uh, the Lesotho uh, High Court uh, upheld a conviction to their official and actually imposed some heavy levies on, on, on these companies in Acres and, and Lohmeyer. The information was shared with Canadian authorities and Canadian authorities did not follow through. They did not investigate and we did, didn't hear about that. Um, and this happened in 2003. Uh, move forward, now we have SNC-Lavalin, where you all have heard, and this case has a very key tie to the World Bank, and I'm hoping Michelle speaks about that tomorrow because I'm going to be running out of time. But, like, there's a big shift in enforcement. Now, it is interesting, I'm going to just talk about two topics that are interesting uh, about the, the Canadian FCPA, and one is the, uh, the fact that two of the cases, the uh, SNC-Lavalin and another case, which is the Nico case, are linked to Bangladesh, this given that we only have a handful of cases. And the other one is that three of the cases that um, happen in Canada happen in the same court, and that was in Alberta. Now, let's move to the, uh, the MDBs, because I only have five minutes. So why do we care? Uh, we care because uh, people don't get the things that they're supposed to be getting. This is a baby warmer, and I'm, 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 Michelle is going to kill me because I'm sure she was going to show this as well. This is a baby warmer in India um, in a health project. Um, this baby warmer uh, was delivered as new, and it has this characteristics. It can risk electric shock to the babies. It does not fit the specifications. Uh, they accepted the delivery as if this was new, and as you can see, it was not new. This is Cambodia, and, and this is part of um, um, a, another project, the Rhodes Project. That's me before the diet, though. Um, I'm going to be selling my book afterwards. You can come in, and I'll sign it for you. I'll give you all the secrets. Uh, but as you can see, uh, that uh, measuring tape is measuring the, the, the width of the road as it should be. And this is how it looks. It was paid in, in, in full. Uh, and did not comply with any of the specifications. Now, that is the government official who was in charge of making that road. And he clearly is asking himself, how did this happen? And I'm not making this up. Um, and, and you could see examples like this all over uh, the you know, countries, country after countries. This is not specific 
to Southeast Asia, it happens in South Asia, it happens in Latin America. In, have, in, in fact, I have some uh, examples here of uh, Latin America where a road was supposed to be built in this landfill, there's no road. Um, where this is a waste deposit that it's supposed to be covered in asphalt. Uh, so the, the chemicals that are part of the waste don't go into the underground and it has no asphalt and it was paid in full. And this was supposed to be looking like the image before with asphalt and of course has nothing. So these are the type of things that we see and how it affects uh, people. Now we, and, and, and Michelle will talk about it tomorrow, we, we have a system to investigate and sanction firms that are involved in this type of activities and that's how we come into the mix because we do similar enforcement to what the, the FCPA or the Canadian authorities, that would be the RCMP and the Department of Justice would do in trying to prosecute these firms. However, we come at it from a different perspective. We're looking at the projects and how we can make the projects better, how we can change what's happening on the ground and how we can uh, build capacity on the ground so this kind of things don't happen and so the money stays there. Uh, and that's why you will see that in most of our cases, um, the, the, the companies that we're going after are small and medium enterprises as opposed to, as opposed to the big Siemens or the big SNC Lavalans. I mean, the SNC Lavalan and Siemens were both the barred by the World Bank, but that's, that's only a small percentage of the type of companies that we go after and that we find guilty in, in our investigations. Uh, and the reason why is because our interest is really on the projects. It's really on, on this, uh, and, and rather than the, the splashy um, uh, headline in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, and this takes a different slant on the type of enforcement that we do and the type of results that we provide. And so when looking at corruption and thinking about the grand enforcement of corruption worldwide, uh, we need to look at it from different perspectives and try to understand what is that we need to measure and how do we measure success. Success should look differently. It not only should be like big fines and, and break, uh, big prison uh, terms for the culprits, but also in how are we actually affecting development on the ground? What are we doing to better people's lives? this time all we have Kevin Davis from NYU. Please, please. Thank you very much. At this time of morning I find it easier to be upright. Uh, keeps me awake. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here at a gathering like this to focus on a problem that I think is actually very important. Now in a lot of my research actually uh, focus on the kinds of cases and legislation and legal initiatives that Tanita and Juan have been talking about. So I've worked on the FCPA and the way that it's enforced. I've done case studies of transnational enforcement actions like the Siemens case and how that unfolded, in particular in Argentina, asset recovery uh, proceedings involving various countries and then more recently work on the domestic anti-corruption systems of particular countries in Latin America. So in each case focusing very much on the law and anti-corruption law and the various control mechanisms that we've developed to go after corruption. But since the title of this panel is Corruption and Development, I thought this would be an opportunity to step back a bit from the the law and the legal mechanisms um, and to focus on that broader question of the relationship between corruption and development and in particular to focus on what we know about that because for me this is the motivation for studying the law this presumption this assumption that corruption is bad for development that it somehow retards development but I think we ought to figure out well how do we know that right um, because if we don't know that for sure then the whole anti-corruption exercise might be misguided in various respects. And so for today's purposes, I'd like to focus on another strand of my research, which has focused on uh, this, the idea of indicators in general, and corruption indicators in particular, right? So um, just thinking about how do we measure the prevalence of corruption? And I like to make two basic claims. First of all, we don't know as much as we think we do about the prevalence of corruption. 
And then secondly, we should pay a lot more attention to why we think we know what we know, what sort of tools we're using to determine uh, the prevalence of corruption, and, how, and their, their quality, their biases, who's producing them, and so forth. So those are the two main points. Uh, so the first point about the quality of uh, what we know. Let's think about how we, as a, as a group, tend to uh, decide that, say, Nigeria and Bangladesh and Kenya and Afghanistan are more corrupt than, say, Denmark or Sweden or Canada, with at least the exception of Quebec. Um, <laughs> so what's the basis for those sorts of beliefs? Well, to a certain extent, it's the kind of anecdotes or case studies that we've heard about so far, right? But it also is based on a certain amount of quantitative research, right? These indicators that I've referred to, which you've already seen of examples of, the kind that Tanita Murray used in her presentation, like the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, right? Or the World Bank's Control of Corruption Index. These are scientifically developed indicators that purport to measure the prevalence of corruption in various countries around the world. Right? So the first thing to know is that there's a lot of literature out there that suggests that those indicators are problematic in some respects. First of all, they're not particularly reliable. And if you think about it, that makes sense. I mean, we're talking about corruption. How would you ever go and measure a completely illicit and illegal activity very reliably? Basically, there are only a handful of ways you can attempt to do it. The first is to measure perceptions, right? So go out and survey people and, on, and ask them, well, how prevalent do you think corruption is in Bangladesh or Kenya or India, et cetera, right? The reasons why there are concerns about perception-based measures have to do with the factors that influence those perceptions, right? One, one factor is, that you'd think would shape people's perceptions of corruption in a given society is just the sheer number of cases they've heard about, the absolute number. Not the relative number, but the absolute number. Right? So if you think about Nigeria, you probably have heard lots of cases of, uh, of uh, corruption from there, and fewer coming from Jamaica. That may tell you nothing about the relative prevalence of corruption, how likely you are to be confronted by a corrupt public official in each of those countries, but you know, in Nigeria you're going to think, well, it's more corrupt than Jamaica because you've heard more about it there. So there is a concern that the size of, a, of countries will bias perceptions of, 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 of the relative, to, relative prevalence of corruption just because the absolute number of cases is going to be larger. Another factor that influences perceptions is obviously the media. So a society with a vigorous free press is where they actively go out and report on corruption scandals may appear more corrupt than one where there's just as much corruption actually going on, but the media is less, less active. So there's a there have been some suggestions that when um, Suharto uh, 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 stepped down in Indi or uh, was removed from power in Indi Indonesia, that corruption increased after the fact. Right? because maybe th there was less control coming from the top over the low-level corruption. That's one theory. Another theory is that, well, there was more free press, and so the corruption that was going on all the time was just better reported, and it's hard to figure out which is actually the case. Another factor is the legal system, the quality of the legal system. The more effective the legal system, the more instances of corruption that are likely to come to light, right? But again, that may not mean that there's actually more corruption going on. And then finally, the openness of the society to trade and investment might influence perceptions of corruption, at least amongst outsiders, right? So a large, a large society like Nigeria, with lots of foreign trade and investment, right? moderately free press, reasonably, well, occasionally effective legal system, might be perceived as more corrupt than a society like Ethiopia, which is more closed and less familiar to some of the people who, whose perceptions are being surveyed. So those are, those are some of the concerns about the perception-based measures of corruption. Now, they can be mitigated to some extent by focusing on the perceptions of experts as opposed to the, the general population, but then you have the difficulty of identifying the experts, making sure that you're sampling, you're, you're coming up with a representative sample of the relevant experts, and trying to figure out whether their perceptions are biased in other ways as well. So the perception-based measures all have those kinds of concerns. Now, there are also experience-based reports. 
right? And Tanita Murray also drew on some of those. So the, uh, some of the, their, 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 their cross-country victimization surveys that ask people, have you paid a bribe or how many bribes have you paid in the past year? Th those are focused on individuals. And then the World Bank Enterprise surveys, which you uh, provided the data from, survey firms and ask them, have you paid bribes and so forth. Those are, all, those are presumably more reliable in some ways than the perception-based uh, surveys because they're based on direct knowledge. The concern, though, is that, that they'll be biased in favor of forms of corruption that are not stigmatized. So you'll be willing to report the bribes that you've paid when you felt like you were being extorted and when you know, you're in the right, you're, you're the victim. You're much less likely to report the, the, the bribes that you instigated, right? So the, 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 the big scandals, like the Kenya cases, though the participants in those, I suspect, are much less likely to volunteer information about their role in, in that kind of corruption. So that's the concern about the experience-based reports. I should say there are also ways of directly observing co corruption, right? Some researchers have gone out and followed truck drivers around, seeing how many bribes they paid to, to uh, the police along the way or roadside inspectors along the way, or they've done it at ports. You can do, the governments do this occasionally when they engage in random audits of municipalities. So there's some good data coming out of Brazil on, that, that's derived from, uh, uh, from government audits. Some very intrepid and well-financed researchers have actually gone out and uh, tested roads. So it, this has been done in, in Indonesia, um, where they've actually gone out and sampled roads to see if they're of the quality that they were supposed to be. So there are ways of measuring corruption fairly directly, at least certain forms of corruption, right? But those are not terribly scalable. It's difficult to find data like that that's available on a cross-country basis. So for all those reasons, um, the, the data we have on uh, corruption, and the, certainly the most popular corruption indicators, are not particularly reliable. We're not sure that they um, are that, that trustworthy. And what's interesting is that they're not necessarily that well correlated with one another either, right? Uh, so those experience-based measures are not terribly well correlated with the perception-based measures. Uh, countries rank quite differently depending on which one you use. Uh, for reasons I'll talk about in a moment, I'm not sure that either is better, I just think they're measuring different things because I, I do think perceptions uh, matter. Okay, a second concern about these indicators. They just met, a lot of them, the cross-country ones, tend to just measure corruption writ large. They aggregate a whole bunch of different phenomena and just call them corruption. Right? And so think about what the, the different kinds of corruption that can be captured by something like the Transparency International Index. It's bribery as well as embezzlement as, as well as conflicts of interest, right? So different forms of corruption in different sectors of government, both the customs, the police service, the, the different, you know, the different, indust different industries. Right. Different levels of government, so the doctors who are taking bribes to provide pharmaceuticals as well as the officials taking bribes to get, um, the high level officials taking bribes to toward concessions, that's all lumped in together. These are very highly aggregated measures. And what's interesting is that some of them not only cover information about corruption itself, corrupt behavior itself, but also the control of corruption. So they, are, they, they mix together information about behavior on the one hand and legal responses to it, because they'll ask, well, how effective do you think the, uh, the anti-corruption mechanisms in your country are? I'm not sure what to make of those kinds of aggregate measures. There's some, there are some situations in which it makes sense to aggregate across different concepts like that, if you think that the phenomena that they're uh, referring to have the same causes or consequences. But in many of the instances that are covered by these indicators, I don't think that's the case. And so there's a real question not only about the, the reliability of these uh, indicators, but also, I think, their validity, meaning what it is they're actually measuring. Right? So for both these reasons, it's not clear to me that the indicators we have are particularly uh, helpful in telling us exactly how much corruption is going on out there. Okay, so that was the first uh, point I wanted to make. The second point, though, is about why this matters. Right? It certainly matters for academic purposes. It matters if we're trying to test theories about either the causes or consequences of corruption. It matters that the theories we have about the causes of corruption 
several of them are validated when you look at the perception-based measures, so it seems like having a common law origin, uh, being predominantly Protestant. Um, let's see, what, uh, there, there's one other factor that's proven to be significant. Let's just run with those two. Those work, right? Those tend to explain perceptions of corruption. Turns out they don't actually explain experiences of corruption, as measured by those enterprise surveys. What do we make of that from a theoretical perspective? This is a problem for academics, right? And our theories about the consequences of corruption might be equally problematic. The idea that corruption actually retards development because we've measured lots of corruption in places like Nigeria or Kenya may not actually be right. It may actually be the ethnic fractionalization in this, those countries that's driving the, the development outcomes if we're getting the measures of corruption uh, wrong. So those are the academic reasons to be concerned about indicators. But I think there are also more practical reasons. And so, for the last few years, I've been part of a project with two of my collaborators, Benedict Kingsbury and um, Sally Mary, called the Indicators as a Technology of Global Governance. Right? It's quite a mouthful, it sounds very academic-y, but it is really trying to make the point that indicators matter out there in the real world. So think about these corruption indicators and how they're actually used. Right? Say the indicators that purport to measure the levels of corruption in Nigeria. Who uses them? First of all, we know that donors use them. The World Bank uses them, the regional development banks use them, or some version of them in deciding how to allocate aid. Right? They tend to be less likely, as we know, and they're less willing, for perfectly good reasons, to allocate aid funds to highly corrupt countries, but they measure the level of corruption using these quantitative indicators because they have to, because they're dealing with large numbers. They can't just base it on uh, qualitative data if you're trying to decide how to allocate funds across 77 countries. But the indicators matter. The quality of the indicators matters for the donors and, of course, for the recipients of those aid funds. Investors also often, at least as a first pass at matters, will decide where to think about locating a factory, for instance, based on, at least to some extent, these kinds of quantitative measures, right? Either directly or maybe indirectly because the measures are then used by the economist in talking about whether a particular country is friendly to investment and that seeps into the popular, con the popular consciousness. And so there is this sense in which the indicators might also influence FDI flows. Right? Thinking about the general population, like if you hear that a your government is consistently ranking among the most corrupt governments in the world, and your country is among the most corrupt governments, uh, countries in the world. How is that going to influence how you interact with public officials? I think it's going to make you more willing, more comfortable with the idea of paying a bribe, right? And on the official side, perhaps more willing to demand a bribe if they think, or to steal some money if you think that everyone else is doing it. Right? And then in terms of your political behavior, you, it might uh, convince you to either drop out of the system entirely, or if you're more active, to oust a government that you, is perceived to be um, corrupt. Either way, the information that you're receiving through these indicators has the potential to influence your behavior. Right? That's really our point. That's why we're studying these indicators, because we think that they influence important decisions, important decisions by both foreigners and members of the society and public officials, and so the quality of the indicators and their biases are actually important, right? So we think of, this is why we call the indicators a technology of governance, a way of influencing behavior, right? And that means that it's worth thinking about how those indicators are constructed, because they're a source of power, and the people who construct the indicators are essentially wielding a form of power. Right? If you take this idea that information is power quite seriously. So that opens up a whole set of research questions about, um, well, what is the relationship between the motivations of indicators pro uh, in indicator producers and the kinds of indicators they actually produce? You know, are there differences between the indicators produced at the global level, perhaps, and indicators produced at the local level, of which there are quite a few? Right? Should we be regulating indicators in some way? Should we rely on um, maybe the professional ethics of the, sci the social scientists who are developing the indicators? 
or the marketplace of indicators to make sure that the best ones rise to the top? Or is there scope for some sort of independent review mechanism, perhaps even within, say, the World Bank or other organizations that are producing these indicators? Should there be somebody outside of the main team that's producing the indicators that's overseeing them and regulating them? Those are some of the questions that uh, my more legally inclined colleagues will ask. But for now, I'll just leave you with the idea that the bottom line is that when we're thinking about corruption and development, this, well, and the implications for corruption control mechanisms, we should spend some time thinking about the corruption indicators because they actually may not be particularly reliable guides to any of the decisions we're making or any of the beliefs we're formulating, but they do matter. And they're actually policy instruments in their own right and they could be thought of that way. Um, so indicators, again, they shape what we know about corruption, but I don't think they're as helpful as we think they are, and we should pay more attention to them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. So this was a wonderful panel to really to get us going, right? There seems to be a lot of corruption out there, spectacular cases like the ones Tonita uh, mentioned to us. How do we measure corruption? What kind of indicators should we be using? And to what end? How should we control? What should be the goal of, of how we seek to handle corruption? Um, so we have about 15 minutes uh, for questions. We really want this to be a free-flowing conference where you feel comfortable asking questions. There are two microphones. Uh, I would invite you uh, to walk up to one of them if you have a question for our panel members. Yes, we have already a first question, so. Who will get there first? <laughs> a race to the bottom. <laughs> if you can please identify yourself before yeah. asking a question, that I, would be wonderful. I'm Michael Robinson. I'm a practitioner lawyer. I'm also a panelist later on on corruption and business. I just wanted to add one comment to what Ken, Kevin said, which was an excellent presentation. And my experience as a practitioner working in international business law, where corruption is like <laughs> one of the subjects I deal with all the time in, ter in terms of clients, is one of the best um, creators of perception indices in addition to TI, w which we know is the, the, the leader and does hard work and we have 256 full-time paid employees in Berlin working on this stuff and making it good, is the accounting and consulting firms because they talk to their own clients off the record, and they get really solid answers. You go to any of the big ones, you know, Price Waterhouse, I mentioned them in a presentation that I'm going to make. They did a really good one <clears throat> focusing on the BRIC countries way back in 98. And the results were uh, in response to the question, uh, is this, do you regard this as a cost of doing business? And that's a really good question, I think. That, a consulting firm can ask their client and say, we're not going to tell anybody what you said. We're just going to make a box score. 78% um, uh, of the respondents said it is in all the BRIC countries. And 50% said it was inevitable in China. Uh, now, that kind of number is a it's a good solid number. You won't get that out of something like TI, which is uh, in, entirely independent and a good organization. I was on the local board here in Canada for the maximum term. Um, but there's a special relationship in the business community that the consultants, they all started as accounting firms, but they make all their money now out of being consulting firms. The accountants slash consultants have with their clients that produces really good, solid numbers, and they should be factored in. Any response? Sure. Uh, th thank, thanks, Michael. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and that those data, I suspect, are great for their clients. So if you want to know about corruption in international business, those are terrific data. Um, and I have no quibbles with that. The, 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 the only 
caveat is there are other forms of corruption out there and corruption that affects other types of businesses, other types of individuals. And there's always the danger that those data are uh, misused or, or is it, are interpreted as measuring all the other kinds of corruption as well. Hello, my name is Michelle Ratpan. I work with the World Bank's Integrity Vice Presidency. So I, I actually had, I think, two questions for Kevin and then one for one. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, I thought your presentation was very interesting. And so I wanted to ask you, you talked about indicators of corruption potentially in certain places, um, make, influencing uh, officials or people to be more corrupt in mm -hmm. those uh, places or reinforcing that. So I wanted to know what you thought about Bangladesh. Um, which is a country that has, you know, indicators of being extremely corrupt, um, where people report uh, corruption uh, in business and in their affairs with government. Uh, recently, last week, the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, reported that there was no corruption in the Padma Bridge, or they basically excused the individuals who were. Mm -hmm. So how does that fit with your model of, um, you know, the sort of whether, whether that means that it reinforces that Bangladesh is um, more, uh, that individuals see it as more corrupt or not? Are you asking me what to, to explain the report or to speculate about the likely consequences? I guess to explain um, whether the report would seem to be um, accurate in the, in the context of what is happening in Bangladesh right now. With, with, the, with the indicators that have come forward of corruption in Bangladesh. So the, I haven't been following the Padma Bridge case okay. very closely at all. So, um, uh, so, you're, the, so and I hadn't, hadn't heard about this report. So the report said there was no corruption whatsoever, notwithstanding the World it, Bank. It said that the officials who had been, there were seven officials that, mm -hmm. they see, that seemed to be responsible in some part for that mm -hmm. act would all be uh, basically acquitted of those charges. Right, so I can't comment on the, the yeah. specifics of the case, and the question is, well, what, so the, I, I, am, I am curious about the, the likely effect going forward, because the, the concern always is when, if, if everyone, if there are other sources of information for the population, right? So I think there's, my sense is that there was a perception that those officials were actually culpable, a widespread perception. Um, and there's, often the sense that this can be, can be very demoralizing, right? Um, so I'm not sure that this has anything to do with the indicators. I think the indicators plus just what everyone knows about the case will lead people to think corruption is pervasive and that the legal system is flawed, that officials can com uh, commit these kinds of acts with impunity, and that might actually make people more fatalistic and perhaps even more willing to engage in corruption going forward. That's a risk. And it's an interesting uh, dilemma, I think, for anti-corruption advocates. Um, uh, do you bring these cases if there's a prospect of failure when the failure might end up having that kind of demoralizing effect? Uh, it's something that I think a lot of countries struggle with. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering yeah, the no, question. Yeah, that, no, that does. And I guess the other thing is that um, so you, you talked about experience-based corruption not necessarily being a, an, a perfect indicator. Mm -hmm. um, but wouldn't you think that experience-based corruption in terms of people coming forward with admissions of their own corrupt mm -hmm. acts, in addition to a country being extremely impoverished together, like, like that correlation would be a good indicator of corruption in a particular country. I think experience-based in indicators are likely to be reliable, right? So to be slightly technical about it, there we can often assume that whatever they're reporting probably happened. The concern is what they're not reporting and what's not covered. So the kinds of corruption that are not being reported and whether, and if you start to, so then this may be a question about their validity. So if you t interpreted an experience-based uh, indicator as a measure of corruption writ large, including the kinds of corruption that are not likely to be reported, then that's where you've got a concern. But on the reliability front, I think most people will say, you know, and there, there are ways of checking this, but I think in general they've, they're, they're believed to be reasonably reliable, but again, on what they're actually reporting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then my last question is for Juan. Um, so we worked on this, this paper together, and I wanted to actually know what you thought, if you look at the Canadian model, and you see the evolution of you know, the Canadian Act, and the few cases, and then you look at the MDBs, and it seems as though 
at the MDB level, there's been more prosecutions or there's been more action. What can Canada really learn from that? I mean, where does Canada stand now at this juncture? And if you were to offer some advice about what can be learned from uh, the MDBs and how they're approaching development issues and corruption issues, what can we bring back here? Could you define MDBs? Just be careful to add some names during the conference if possible. Sorry? Could you define MDBs? You oh, I'm sorry. MDBs, Multilateral yes. Development Banks. So, uh, thanks. Uh, sorry for speaking lingo, but yeah, it's uh, multilateral development banks, which is the, all the regional banks and, and, and the World Bank. I, I think that the, the, my, my take on all of this is really that if, if you look at corruption as a crime that has victims, uh, and especially international corruption, uh, for people sitting in Canada or in the U.S., it's hard to picture those victims. So when they end up imposing a, not imposing a, a, a fine, but m most of this, for instance, prosecutions in the U.S. end up in agreements, in settlement agreements. And there's this huge fines, and in fact, there's a very interesting um, um, book written by the Star Initiative from the World Bank that says how many how much money has been paid in this type of settlements, and I think it's in the order of six billion dollars, and not much of that money has gone back to the countries where the bribe occurred. Uh, most of it stays in, in developed countries. I think that the issue is, how do you see, as you know, in Canada, how do you see yourself enforcing this law that actually has to do with acts that occur abroad? And what is your role in that international relation? So it's okay to enforce a, a law that has to do with acts that occur abroad. Um, and because now we're witnessing an internationalization of the world or globalization, whichever way you want to call it, uh, we're applying that law abroad. Where are the victims? And, and what are we doing about that and about trying to bring development to those countries? Because usually it happens in developing countries. I would take that from what we're doing at the MDBs, which is what are we learning from the corruption schemes we're seeing and how we can retrofit the, the projects that we have so we can actually build capacity in country and try to ensure that people understand the effects of corruption in their own communities. Uh, yesterday we were talking about uh, a case in, again, Cambodia, where uh, this village had received some funds from the World Bank to do some wells, and they actually took the money and didn't build some of the wells. And when speaking to the community and to the elder who was in charge of this, um, I said, you know, we went there and you don't have the well. Uh, yet you charge for that well and you passed the bill and we paid that bill. And the guy pretty much looked with a face, so what? And when I explained to them, you understand that your children and your grandchildren are gonna be paying this because this is not a grant. We're not giving you the money for free your country is going to have to repay, and you're going to have to be paying taxes for all of that money that you <coughs> use for whatever other purpose. You understand that. And of course, this is in translation because my Khmer is very, very bad. Uh, but you could see the faces of the people in the village as I was saying this and it was being translated. They sort of started to understand, oh, so we have to pay that money back. Uh, I think that that is a very important connection that needs to happen. And if enforcing a law like this one that has exter an, a, a huge extraterritoriality component to it, you need to figure out what is your role in that. Can we take Thank you. two last questions? The two gentlemen who are standing, starting with the person at my left. Hi. <coughs> Sorry, Mark Warner, local ambulance chaser. Um, my question, I guess, for you is that uh, comes out of taking advantage of the fact that we're talking in a university today to ask a question a little bit out of left field. but. Uh, I once did some work advising a pharmaceutical client that was trying to sell its to give its antiretroviral drugs, AIDS drugs, uh, away in Africa. And the trouble that we had was that we had um, people administering it who had moved from the United States back to South Africa. And so it got me thinking, and we ended up having some money that went off in different directions and yada yada, to make it simple. So what it got me thinking about is, well, what is corruption, which we really sort of jumped ahead in this panel to talking about sort of corruption is bad, but if I think back to economics, people think about wage rates or being the equivalent to the marginal product of labor. And I'm sometimes wondering that what we call corruption is just the reality that the wage rates don't really equal the marginal product of labor in a lot of developing countries if you're talking about 
highly sophisticated individuals who could be working outside of their home country. And sometimes what we see and call corruption is actually a way of equating the wage rate to the marginal product of labor, and maybe really isn't corruption, but just a way of having the system make the markets um, for, for get to the right point. Anyway, so that's, since I'm in a university, thought I'd ask that. We're going to take the second question and then ask the panelists. My question is exactly the same, and, and, and it, it, it's simply, is there, is there a shared uh, understanding of what corruption is that one could capture in a definition, and how does it relate to fraud? Is it the same as fraud, or is fraud a subset of corruption? When each of you use the, the designation, do you have a common understanding of what you mean by it? Could maybe I'll I'll start the ball rolling on this one. I th economists talk about grand corruption and petty corruption, and grand corruption are the sorts of cases I talked about, which are uh, perpetrated by people. Uh, in uh, policy positions in high office. Petty corruption is usually the routine sorts of bribe taking that a lot of public officials um, engage in. And um, it often is, as Mark was saying, a, a sort of way of uh, some sort of equity in the economic system, making sure that poor wages are made up to some extent. And the person who's exacting a bribe today may well be paying a bribe tomorrow to another government official in a, another um, department. <coughs> it's a sort of informal tax. Governments often rely on it. In, in Afghanistan, for example, um, when I first went there in 2003, the police had not been paid for six months. So it was by exacting bribes at checkpoints that they were actually to take, able to take home money to, to their families to, to eat. Um, so there is always that understanding, but the thing is that it, it leads to a sort of endemic uh, culture of corruption and <coughs> people end up being quite acquiescent about paying bribes and take it as part of the system and no, no one any longer uh, challenges it. And you're absolutely right in both of your observations that we do tend to... Um, and, and as Mark talked about this, seeing corruption in the aggregate, whether it's indicators or in descriptions of corruption, not to make the distinctions between the levels of corruption. And um, the, the lower level corruption often comes out of that client-patron culture or a social organization, the, the, you know, the, the sort of social exchanges in a society. And um, after all, our own countries had the same sorts of systems until, what, maybe a century ago or a little bit more. Um, so I think we all have a general understanding of what corruption is, but we are not very... Um, you know, sort of uh, careful to make the distinctions that do exist. Uh, <coughs> I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and that's probably one of the things that I was trying to, to, to address from a different perspective, which is what are the effects and, and how this is seen during the enforcement. But th there are many different understanding of what, understandings of what corruption is. Uh, in the multilateral development banks, we have something called the prohibited practices, and we have harmonized those among the banks. And that includes fraud, corruption, collusion, obstruction, coercion, and all of those have definitions. And if you look at the definition of corruption that we have, it's very different from the one that appears on the FCPA or even the one that appears on the OECD convention. Uh, the FCPA and the Canadian uh, uh, Foreign Bribery Act and then and then the OECD speak about foreign officials and the payment giving or something of value to government officials 
to do something or abstain to do something, uh, we at the MDBs don't, don't qualify the subject that is doing this, so it could be any person. But from the practitioner's point of view, and if you talk to the people, the, the, enforcement, the enforcers in the US, you will probably hear the same kind of answer. Uh, you, you will hear from them that when they're prosecuting cases, either at, uh, on, on the civil track, which is the, the SEC, or when they do it on the criminal side, which is the DOJ, they tend to go either for books and records uh, prohibition, which is like having lie or say, lied or saying something that is wrong in their uh, financial statements, or for fraud. In our case, you'll see that most of the cases that we do at the multilateral development banks have to do with fraud. Uh, and, and that is because of, pra of a practical matter. It, it is easier to prove fraud uh, in, in all of these cases than, than to prove corruption. Uh, the, the, the evidence of the, the, the giving of something, usually you don't find it in a, in a receipt. Although I have some examples in which you actually find the receipt of somebody giving somebody something of value to do something that they were not supposed to do. And there's one example that there's in a presentation that the World Bank has and another one and one that I have. Uh, at the IDB where there's the receipt, but oftentimes you don't find that. Uh, and, and there's alternative ways to get at things that you know are wrong and from the prosecutorial point of view, the best way to go about it is through fraud. So there's a combination of things, but in, in, in the big scheme of things, we mean different things when we're talking about corruption. And, and Tonita is absolutely right in terms, of talking, in terms of talking about grand corruption and petty corruption. You can dive in into different sort of issues and also when you're talking about political corruption and influence or you're talking about you know the fine line between lobbyists and 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 mingling with politics and what is corruption what is not it is a loosely used word and and it is a problem so when you're talking about it you probably should better frame it within a body of of, of law jurisdiction or or legal uh, space where you want to talk about it so since I'm a law professor speaking to a distinguished judge, I will stick to the legal definition of corruption that I work with. Uh, usually, I focus on the offenses defined in the UN Convention Against Corruption, the offenses that it's mandatory for the signatories to criminalize. So bribery, embezzlement, and then laundering of the proceeds of those offenses. There are other legal uh, uh, definitions of corruption that you can find even in the UN Convention, um, like commercial bribery. You know, that's something that's optional for the parties to criminalize, or illicit enrichment, or concealment, right, or abuse of public office, right. But I think the core of corruption for most people is captured by those two initial offenses in the UN Convention, bribery of public officials, I should have mentioned that, and embezzlement or misappropriation of funds by those officials. Okay. So to, to Mark's question about whether there is such a thing as uh, uh, beneficent, or benign at least, corruption. Uh, you know, it's, when I first started studying uh, corruption, actually this was uh, when I was a law student at a school down the road um, uh, with Michael Trebilco, um, it was the academic view on corruption was much more ambivalent, actually, than it is today. The, the theory that there was such a thing as efficient corruption had much more currency at that point. And for a long time, it, you know, there was that view. It was a way of efficiently cutting through red tape. Uh, it's only since the, I'd say, the 80s and 90s that the, the opposing view, which is that corruption is always bad for development, is unequivocally problematic, has really uh, come into ascendancy. And part of the reason why that uh, latter view has won out is because it's been uh, uh, corroborated empirically, which of course is problematic because some of that corroboration is based on the kinds of indicators, the kinds of measures of corruption that I was just criticizing a few minutes ago. Um, you know, so there have been cross-country studies showing that corruption is negatively correlated with uh, development outcomes, but I'm not so sure about the data that's gone into those studies. Okay, so the, but there is that empirical case uh, against the efficient cr corruption theory. There's also a theoretical case, and it usually focuses, so the strongest version of the argument really is for bribery. It's hard to think about, you have to be quite creative to come up with reasons why embezzlement on the part of public officials might be desirable. But there are claims that are being made, uh, that have been made about bribery being an efficient way of compensating underpaid public officials, right? 
and they'll just offer better services to the people who are willing to pay more, who are probably the highest value users of their services, right? So that's the kind of argument that's been made. The objection is that since you're dealing with public officials, they're also in a position to create the demand for their services, right? So it's not like the red tape that they're offering to cut just a appears out of nowhere and that, you know, you're just helping them, the, the payment is helping you navigate through that red tape that really is an exogenous uh, variable in the analysis. In fact, if officials know that they can collect money for cutting red tape, they have an incentive to generate more red tape to begin with. And so that's the theoretical reason why it's not clear that it's ultimately, in a, in a sort of dynamic setting, why over the long run, or even the medium term, it's a good idea to allow people, uh, allow officials to collect bribes for uh, evading red tape and so forth. So that's more or less where the, the academic thinking on this uh, is right now. Excellent. With this note, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very enlightening first panel. Uh,